Uh, many thanks for the invitation. I'm really, really sorry not to be there in person. Um, I've felt like one of my students the last few days, like lurking in the background, listening to things without my camera on. But um, uh, it's been very interesting. I've learned a lot of stuff, so thanks. Um, uh, it hasn't got me out as quite as much admin as I thought it was going to, because I'm actually here. So I was just in a meeting planning how our room occupancy for COVID. So I'm very glad to have got out of that. Um, I'm going to talk about some work with Mark Budgen, Andre Hulick, and Friedrich Valak. And I think Friedrich is in the audience. So if you have questions, please ask him in person. And it's based on the couple of papers. Um, let me give you an idea about what I'm going to talk about. Um, so I'm just, there's going to be no alpha primes here. There's going to be no sigma models. I'm just going to talk about supergravity. And I'm going to talk about the relation between three different things. So one is consistent truncations. That's a consistent truncations are truncations of a theory where the truncated solutions of the truncated theory are also solutions of the original theory. Uh, Poisson Lee T and U duality, which I think you all know well about. And um, certain classes of Leibniz algebras that appear in consistent truncations. And the connections between these, like this is not for my own work, lots of people over the last few years, we sort of understand that these things, uh, the connections between them can be understood using generalized geometry. So in supergravity, you can reformulate supergravity using generalized geometry. And that reformulation helps you understand the connections between these. And I'm mostly going to review those connections. And then I'm going to introduce a particular class of algebraid, a, new, a, a type of algebraid we call G-algebraids, that gives us sort of um, unified description of the, of the structures that appear. And uh, in some ways, where it's going to end up is giving some picture of poisson lee duality that's sort of at the same uh, level as the sort of klimchik severa uh, picture of T-duality. So I hope that kind of general picture is OK. Um, please interrupt me if you have questions. Uh, I'm really happy to try and help. All right, so let me start by reviewing a little bit what these things are. So I'm going to start with consistent truncations. So as I said, a consistent truncation is something where a solution of the truncated theory is also a solution of the full theory. So let me give you a really simple uh, example. So suppose we have two scalar fields. Um, let me just get this right. Suppose we have two scalar fields. Uh, sorry. Um, which are uh, uh, phi and lambda with some coupling. Um, Hi, Dan. We are sorry, something's you. overlapping the page, right? Yeah. Uh, is that better? Yeah, it's back again now. Okay. So um, we can write down their equations of motion. And you notice that uh, there's two different truncations we could make. We could turn off lambda or we could turn off phi. If we turn off lambda, that's inconsistent because lambda is a source, it's, uh, because lambda is sourced by phi. So if we have, we can't consistently set um, lambda, to, uh, lambda to zero because once we turn on phi, it will turn on some lambda. Now, if we look at low energy, if we're energies way below the mass scale of lambda, that would be approximately okay. And that's typically what one does when one does dimensional reductions. One just looks at low energy modes and you can ignore the modes you drop. But I'm asking something stronger here that you really want to be able to consistently drop the mode. If we turn off phi, then uh, we can consistently drop it because, uh, because phi doesn't source lambda. Uh, sorry, the other way around, because uh, lambda doesn't source phi. Um, and you can understand why it's consistent is because there's a symmetry reason. So there was a symmetry of this theory where we take phi to minus phi and lambda unchanged. And what we're doing when we turn off phi is to keep all the singlets under that symmetry. And that's typically the way consistent truncations work. There's usually some symmetry reason for why you can truncate the theory. So the thing we're really interested in is a truncation that's got a dimensional reduction. So we might have some gravity theory in D dimensions and we want to reduce it on some space, which I'm calling MN. So our space time is a product. In general, MN is going to be compact. It could in principle be a vibration over the space X, but let's not worry too much about that. And we want to reduce that to some theory on X. 
So normally we have some Kaluza Klein reduction. And the idea is you want to keep a finite number of modes so that the reduced theory, so we just keep a finite number of Kaluza Klein modes so the reduced theory, solutions of the reduced theory are solutions upstairs. And of course, the classic example of this is the standard Kaluza Klein reduction where you reduce on a torus and you just keep all the zero modes, the things that are uncharged under the isometries of the torus. And again, there's a, there's a group theory reason why that works because uncharged modes can't source the charge modes. So if you only, if you keep all the uncharged modes and drop all the charge modes, you're good because they won't be able to source the ones you drop. Uh, and you get some low energy theory, which has some gauge fields and some scalars and so on. And that's nice and consistent. So any solution of that low energy theory will also be a solution upstairs. Um, more generally, you could imagine reducing on any Lie group and you could keep just the left invariant modes. And that's what's known as a Schirk Schwartz reduction. It could be a group or it could be some quotient of the group by some Lie group by some finite group, but roughly it's just a Lie group. Um, and again, the, the fact that the singlets, things that are invariant under the right action, under the left action, can't source the ones that are non-invariant means that you get something consistent. And the lower dimensional theory will always become some gauge theory with a gauge group that's, that's uh, the right action on the group. So we're interested in trying to understand what are the different ways you can do this? How can you make consistent dimensional reductions? Now, there's a particular class of dimensional reductions you might be interested in, which are the ones that come from reducing supergravities. So we might start with 11-dimensional supergravity or type 2A or type 2B. Type 2A, we can just include in 11-dimensional because it's just reducing on a circle. Uh, so we can reduce either from 11 or 10 dimensions. And if we do reducing on some manifold that's n-dimensional or n-1 dimensional, and if we do that reduction on a Schirk-Schwartz type reduction of the type I just described, where you choose some group, you get a maximally supersymmetric theory in the, in the dimension, dimensionally reduced theory. And, but in general, it's a gauge theory. So it will have a gauge group given by the uh, group that you're reducing on, and it will have some scalars, but those scalars will have a potential, and that potential arises along with the uh, gauge. So most of the dimension, most of the consistent truncations we know of are of that type, just Schirk Schwartz. But interestingly, along uh, uh, ancient history now, there are also some remarkable consistent truncations that are not of Schirk Schwartz type, which are still maximally supersymmetric. So you can reduce 11 dimensional supergravity on a four sphere or a seven sphere, or, five, or type 2b on a five sphere and still get a consistent truncation. And we're not reducing on groups, so it's certainly not, not this uh, ordinary Schirk-Schwartz reduction. So, uh, and again, they give some gauge supergravity, some maximum supersymmetric gauge supergravity. So let's just go into a little bit more detail on that. So uh, maximally supersymmetric gauge supergravity are described using this formalism called the embedding tensor. It goes back to work by Nikolai and Sam Flavin and DeWitt and Sam Flavin and collaborators. So what is the embedding tensor? Well, the embedding tensor is actually uh, Leibniz algebra. So what is that? So we just have some vector space, P, with a bracket. Um, but the bracket is not um, anti-symmetric. Uh, but it does satisfy some Leibniz condition. So if you think of the bracket as being an action by U, some adjoint action by U, the Leibniz condition tells you that it first acts on V and then acts on W. So it's like a, it's like a differential. Now, if you choose a basis for the vector space, then you can write the bracket using some structure constants. And those structure constants are what are usually called, is, is what is called the embedding tensor. So this tensor that appears in the gauge supergravity is essentially telling you about some, defining some uh, Leibniz algebra. If you take, if you define an adjoint action, which is just the action of each element in the bracket, their commutator forms a Lie algebra. And that's the Lie algebra that's gauged in the gauge, in the uh, maximally supersymmetric gauge theory. So we're sort of left with a natural question. Two questions. 
we saw that there were these shirk Schwartz reductions. One is that, is there, a, is there a geometrical understanding of these extra ones, these spheres? And are there any other ones that we, that we can get this way? We had nice ge geometrical understanding of the shirk Schwartz. There was a reason it was consistent was because of the group structure. What about the spheres? And then the other question is a sort of landscape question, which is, what are all the what, what are the string consistent truncations? So what kinds of Leibniz algebras, embedding tensors, can you get when you, uh, if you have a consistent truncation from 10 or 11 dimensions? So actually both these questions have been answered. And the first answer to the first one is there's a sort of generalization of Schwartz called generalized Schwartz, which you can understand in generalized geometry. And I'll tell you a bit what that is. And the second landscape question has been answered at a very nice paper by Inverso. And that's something we're going to come back to. And we're going to sort of rewrite what Inverso did in a slightly different language. OK, so I was now going to move on to the connection to duality. Does anyone have any questions at this point? You can go ahead. OK. Um, so what about the connection to duality? Well, uh, this is something that's been stressed by lots of people. For example, it's a nice place of Mike Bolt and uh, Dan Thompson about it. So um, suppose you have two different consistent truncations that lead to the same lower dimensional theory. That means that if you have a solution of the lower dimensional theory, it uplifts in two different ways. We said that lower dimensional solutions are always solutions upstairs. So we get two dual solutions, one on x times m and one on x times m tilde. So from that point of view, a solution downstairs gives you, yeah, gives you two solutions upstairs, and we can think of these two solutions as dual to each other, in the sense that there's some symmetry that's, that generates solutions. If I have one, I have the other. Um, so let's just do a simple example. So let's do some... Uh, uh, old example of Satsos and Thompson on ADS bioprocess five, where they did the non abelian T dual of the three spin. So I write the metric in a way that has an ADS factor, and then I take the five sphere and I fiber it by, uh, I fiber it by three spheres. So the three spheres is like a SU2. So I can do my Schurk Schwartz reduction, or I can do a, a reduction on the SU2. I get some seven dimensional gauge supergravity because I started in type 2b. And the ADS5 process 5 corresponds to a half BPS solution of that seven dimensional gauge supergravity. But I could get the same seven dimensional gauge supergravity by reducing on a different space, which is the non abelian T dual of the S3. So I can uplift the seven dimensional solution either to the original ADS5 process 5 or to the dual thing. So we have two solutions, but, uh, and they're dual because they lead to the same gauge supergravity. Um, now in this case, it's supple because this three sphere collapse can collapse. And so like we actually have to think harder about the global properties, but the general picture is clear. Um, so there's another natural question, which is how can different truncations give the same Leibniz algebra? So how can we have two dimensional reductions to give the same gauge supergravity? And how, could, how does this relate to some notion of Poisson the U duality if we thought about reductions from 11 dimensional supergravity. Uh, does it also, can we understand generalized Yang Baxter deformations this way and so on? So there's a literature that's been around in the last few years due to Sakatani, Malik and Thompson, and Messiah and others, who thought about generalizations of uh, Poisson the T duality to the U duality case. So again, I'm going to talk about those um, using some of these structures that appear in generalized geometry. Um, Okay, so I'm now going to start talking about algebraids, how they appear, how the certain algebraids appear in supergravity, and then how we're going to give some um, define an object which sort of is a sort of universal object that captures all the, all the different things that appear in supergravity. So, um, from a geometrical, from a, from a physics point of view, an algebraid is just something, it's the set of, it's this thing that describes. Uh, the symmetries of a theory with uh, gravity. So it's when you have some set of symmetries that includes diffeomorphisms plus some more stuff. Or at least that gives you lots of good examples. So the simplest case of the Lie algebra is suppose we just have a charged scalar charged under U1. So now the variations of the scalar are parameterized by infinitesimally, by infinitesimal diffeomorphisms, by the Lie derivative, by respect to Xi. 
and then by a gauge transformation with some gauge parameter alpha. So we can put the two things together, the psi and the alpha into a single vector, which you might call a generalized vector, which is some section of a, bundle, of a vector bundle, which is now n plus one dimensional. It's the tangent bundle plus one extra direction, because we're just doing u1. And if you do the algebra of the symmetries, you get a bracket on this psi plus alpha object. And on the vector part, it's just the ordinary Lie bracket. And on the alpha part, it just looks like the Lie derivatives of the alpha. And this uh, object is a Lie algebra. It's a particular, very simple Lie algebra. You can abstract this notion. So you now have generalized vector space E. You have a map from E into the tangent back into the tangent space that sort of picks out the tangent part of your generalized vectors. And you have some bracket. And the bracket is a Lie bracket, so it's anti-symmetric and satisfies Jacobi. And then there's some condition on if I rescale one of the vectors by a function, how that goes through the bracket, which basically just says that the bracket does derivatives, has a derivative part along, um, along the vector part of the vectors in E. Now, this, this generalizes a bit what we had before. In particular, we're no longer thinking um, uh, that this anchor map E um, doesn't have to be, um, uh, it doesn't, doesn't have to be subjective, doesn't have to map down to the whole of, whole of T. You can have, um, uh, and furthermore, um, actually strictly, if you look at the details of the geometry, you can't always write E as TM plus something as a direct sum. In general, it's, it's twisted. It's better to write it as an exact sequence. But the idea is, is, is the one I just gave. Um, what about if we went to the symmetries of the Never Schwartz, Never Schwartz sector of type two? Um, well, that gives an example of what's called a current algebra. So there the symmetries are diffeomorphisms together with gauge transformations to the two forms. So they're parameterized by a psi doing the infinitesimal diffeomorphisms and a lambda, which is a one form giving the gauge transformations of the two form. So now my generalized vector is a combination of a vector and a one form. Uh, that vector space looks like T plus T star. So it's now two N dimensional. And again, there's a bracket, which you get by just commuting the, the, uh, the gauge transformations. On the vector part, it looks like the ordinary Lie bracket. It has a bit that looks like a Lie derivative. And then there's this extra bit. Um, so the, the net bracket is no longer um, anti-symmetric. And this bracket is called the Dorfman bracket or sometimes the generalized Lie derivative. So we naturally have a bracket, as I said. Uh, now we don't have a Jacobi relation, but instead we have a Leibniz relation for this bracket. And if you take the symmetric part of the bracket, it has a very particular property. It looks like the, so the symmetric part of the bracket will be a generalized vector. So it's a combination of a vector and a one form. And it turns out it's only got a one form bit and it's the exterior derivative of a number. And that number is the O is a, defined using a metric on the, on the space of generalized vectors. And that metric is just an O and N metric. So, in addition to the uh, sort of Leibniz algebraic structure we have, so there's some algebraic which satisfies a Leibniz relation, we get this very particular additional information that's appearing in the symmetric part. And this ONN is just the ONN that appears in generalized geometry and appears in uh, double field theory and so on. This is very familiar to people who know that. Uh, the current algebra can be generalized again. So again, now, instead of having E as the sum of T plus T star, you just have a map down to T, some anchor, and you still have some bracket. Um, so it has a Leibniz relation, it has this uh, symmet the symmetric part uh, as above, and then there's this condition on rescaling by F, which just tells you that it looks like a differential along the vector, vector part. Um, what if you go one more? What if we go to 11 dimensions supergravity? Or if we equivalently actually do type 2b and include the Ramon Ramal fields? So, so long as we restrict to n less than or equal to 6, uh, we get a similar structure. So now we have diffeomorphisms. We have gauge transformations of the three form of 11 dimensional supergravity. I'm calling them omega. 
And it's natural to formulate things using the dual field, uh, field too. The three form has a full form field strength. It's dual is a seven form field strength. So that's a six form potential. I'm calling it A tilde. So there's also gauge transformations of A tilde, which I'm parameterizing by a five form sigma. So now the generalized vector is a combination of a vector, a two form and a five form. And there's a bracket, which has a particular structure. It has a new term, which involves two two forms. That's the last term there, that omega prime wedge d omega. And this also satisfies uh, a Leibniz relation. It's again, not anti-symmetric. It's symmetric part can again be written as the exterior derivative of something. And I'm writing it, uh, so the last line there, you see it's the exterior derivative of some combination of the objects that appear in the generalized vectors. Um, but uh, you can also write it in a slightly different way. So it turns out that there's a map which takes the symmetric product of generalized vectors and maps it into some other vector bundle N. And N in general is a combination of one forms, four forms, and some funny object, which is the tensor product of a one form and a six form. And this map, if you have the two bundles E and N and this map, you can ask uh, what transformations can I make, general transformations can I make that in E and N that leave the map invariant or give, make it an equivariant map. And it turns out that group is the exceptional group. It's the split form of the exceptional group together with an overall rescaling, so some R plus. And these E and M bundles form irreducible exceptional group modules. Um, and once you have that exceptional group, you then also for free get a map that takes you from E star tensor N into E. And then this last term that I wrote down at the end, this symmetrization can be written using those two maps. So that's what this, for this middle expression is. You first take V, U, and V, which are generalized vectors, map them into N using this map, and then take that N with D. D is the exterior derivative, so it lives in E star. So you take N tends to E star and map it into E, that's the second. I should say this, this, these structures were actually very nicely described in, um, in David's talk earlier in the week. So I'm just repeating some things he said. Um, it's also perhaps worth noting that in, in coordinates, these brackets, both for the ONN case and the EN case, look like sort of ONN and ENN nice covariant expressions. So you can write them in a way which is, uh, uses the ONN and the ENN structure. So we'd like to have some general definition of this kind of object, this exceptional algebraic, in the same way we had definitions of the current algebraics that sort of went beyond the examples that we got directly from supergravity. Uh, so that's one thing that we're going to come to. Um, but before we go there, I want to talk about how we can understand, now that we have this algebraic structure, how can we understand these uh, this uh, sphere examples of consistent truncations, how can we understand consistent truncations in general? So we want to sort of somehow extend the Schirk-Schwartz construction. So if we go back to the Schirk-Schwartz construction, we had a group and the key thing was that we had a set of left invariant vector fields, left invariant one forms. And by expanding all the fields in just the left invariant objects, we got some consistent truncation. Um, so the left invariant vector fields, of course, give us some global basis for the tangent space. That means that the group manifold is parallelizable. And furthermore, they're under the Lie bracket, their bracket just gives us the structure constants of the, of the, the algebra. So the natural thing to do when we go to try and generalize is to now think about not the, uh, the, uh, the algebra of vector fields, but the, um, current or exceptional algebra that you get for generalized vector fields. So suppose we have some set of generalized vector fields E hat that form a global basis for the generalized vector bundle. So I'm gonna focus on the exceptional case but pretty, pretty well have done, uh, the ODD case. I should say when I did the example of the exceptional case, I, I did it for, for the 11 dimensional supergravity but you could equally well have done it for type 2B, just got different bundles. 
And then we can require that this global basis under the bracket, under the, uh, under the, this bracket defined by the exceptional algebra, um, you get a whole, you get a set of uh, constants. And those constants are going to be none other than the embedding tensor of the uh, dimensionally reduced theory. So we've just taken the ordinary notion of a left invariant vector fields and sort of generalized it. And you can then, it turns out that all the supergravity fields can be described using generalized tensors. So those are objects that transform under this uh, E and N group. This is the story of uh, exceptional field theory. So using that, you can expand them using only the basis. So you can keep only things which are written in terms of the global basis with constant coefficients. If you do that, you then indeed get a maximally supersymmetric consistent truncation. And as I said, the embedding tensor of the theory downstairs is just given by the X that appears in the algebra of the E's. So this is, an ex this is a generalized Schurk-Schwarz reduction. And beautifully, it includes the sphere examples. So let's just look at one of those. So if we just do the four sphere, we can have some coordinates Y that give us the embedding of the four sphere in five dimensional space. The generalized tangent space will be vectors plus two forms. The group is E4, which is the same as SL5. The generalized tangent space is 10 dimensional. And we can define this generalized Leibniz parallelization, that's this set of E's. We can think of that they're being labeled by an anti-symmetric pair of the MN indices. So they were running from one to five. So there'll be 10 of these objects. And in their vector part, they're just the SO5 killing vectors on the four sphere, the rotations. And on their two form part, they're the Hodge dual of dy, which dym, which dym. So interestingly, although separately, the vector part and the two form part can vanish as you move around the sphere. So they don't give you a global, they're not, they don't give you a global frame. However, the combination never, you never get both of them vanishing at the same point. So, so the E's, the capital E's are indeed globally defined and give a, and give a parallelization of the bundle E. So although the sphere isn't parallelizable, the bundle E, the tangent space on the sphere isn't parallelizable, the bundle E is parallelizable. And there's a secret bit, which I haven't really described here, which is there also has to be some flux around, but it doesn't, it just, the basic idea is the one I've described. Okay, so we've got this picture now that um, consistent truncations correspond to um, these uh, generalized parallelizations, Leibniz parallelizations. Um, we would like to understand all the ways we can do a Leibniz parallelization, because that will help us both understand this question, this sort of landscape question about what general, what, um, what theories can you get as consistent truncations. It will also give us a hope of understanding what uh, U-duality might be if we can find two different um, generalized parallelizations, which lead to the same uh, reduced theory. So to answer those questions, it's useful to introduce a slightly new extended notion of, of algebra, which we call G-algebra. So this gives us a sort of more universal picture that allows us to treat each case, uh, allows us to treat both ODD and ED and EN in the same way. Um, it allows us to give a sort of general definition of an exceptional algebra, and it leads to a simpler way of thinking about how to classify these, these parallelizations. That's the idea. Okay, so here's the data that goes into this object, and it's sort of motivated very strongly from the O and N examples and the EN examples. So we start with a generalized tangent space E, and we have another bundle N. We have a bracket on E. We have an anchor map, which takes you from E to the tangent space. And we have a new operator, which we call D, which takes sections of N into sections of E. And then finally, we have this uh, map that takes two elements of E and gives you an element of N, and it's symmetric. So this is actually all the bits that appeared in the exceptional case we just mentioned. So E and N are vector bundles. 
this map is subjective. Um, and there's a group G, which is the group that preserves that map, makes that map, map equivariant. So I'm going to call that group G. So then what properties do you have? You have Leibniz for the bracket. You have the usual relation, the third one I've written there, which just tells you that it's differential with respect to the vectors. And then you have that the symmetrization of the bracket has to be some D, the D operator acting on V, U with V projected into N. That was just the same as we saw in both the ODD case and the exceptional case. And then finally, D has some property which tells you how it's differential. And in fact, that, that, uh, that last condition actually is enough to determine D. So it's not really independent. And then finally, there's a condition, the bracket has to preserve the G structure that's defined by this, by this, uh, this G that, that, that leaves the, um, the map, uh, map onto N and bearing. So that's the data. It looks slightly involved. Don't worry too much. It covers all the examples that we already talked about. So if we just had a Lie algebra, if we just take N to be zero, there is no map. If we have a current algebra, N is R, and the map is just the um, ODD metric, right? That took two generalized vectors and gives you a number. In the case, in the exceptional case, which we uh, called an algebroid, exceptional algebroid, E and N have to be particular bundles that transform in the right, the, the, the right dimensions to, to be modules for the E N group. And you can pick them out from uh, the representations that appear in the um, Dinkin diagram. So I've labeled them in these Dinkin diagrams for the, different, for the different cases. And in that case, the group becomes the exceptional group together with an R plus three scaling. Interestingly, in the second case, the group really also has an R plus three scaling. And that gives you a slight extension of a current algebra, which sort of naturally includes the dilaton in a, more sense, in, 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 in a way. Okay, so this definition has ca captures the, th the three cases we've already considered, and it also has it, um, it also has many other examples or some other examples. You have to be a bit more precise in the definition from the way I've given it, but if you if you tighten it down a bit, you can you can have several other examples that are of interest. Um, and for those of you who know about the tensor hierarchy, you shouldn't be surprised by what I'm doing. These bundles E and N are just two steps in the tensor hierarchy. So in a way, I'm just restricting to two sets in the tensor. But this thing is a little more general than the exceptional uh, algebraids we defined before. So it turns out you always have a set of maps using the, using the um, map onto E. You always have a set of maps that take T star M tensor N into E and then into T. And if these maps are exact at TM, then we have what's called a transitive G algebra. If they're exact at both E and TM, you have what's called an exact G algebra. And the exact G algebra are the ones that I described before that correspond to the supergravity. So an exact current algebra is the one that corresponds to the Never Schwartz, Never Schwartz sector of supergravity. An exact, uh, an exact algebra, the one with the exceptional group, you can show that there's only two possibilities if it's exact. One of them corresponds to 11 dimensional supergravity and the other corresponds to type 2b. So we get these two different pictures of, of the maximum of the symmetric case. Okay. Not only that, you can also consider these objects over a point. So you can take the manifold to just be a point. So now it's just some algebra. We call that a G algebra. And it turns out that G algebra is just the embedding tensor algebra. So if we do it for the case of an of a exceptional group, you just get the embedding tensor of a maximal supergravity. And if you do it in the case of um, the o, o and N case, you get the embedding tensor of a half maximal supergravity. And in that case, what was a Leibniz algebra actually just becomes a Lie algebra. And it just becomes a Lie algebra with a, with a um, metric on it, just as in Klimchik and Severa's description of uh, of um, non-abelian TD bounds. Okay. So this G algebra picture has allowed us to capture both the supergravity symmetries that we're interested in, and also the structure of the um, embedding tensor, which describes the reduced theorem. 
Okay. But having set this up, how can we use it? So I'm now going to use it to understand the classification of the Leibniz parallelizations. So we can use this language to see what we mean by a generalized Leibniz parallelization and then try and understand uh, when they exist. So a generalized Leibniz parallelization, again, this is very like what happens in current algebra, is just a pullback of a G algebra. So suppose we have a manifold and we have a map to a point phi, and over the point we have a G algebra, E. We can pull that back to define some bundle E prime over the manifold. And the question is, when is that E prime, when is it a G algebra? If that E prime is a G algebraoid, then we have a Leibniz parallelization. Okay. So we'd like to know when that works. What's the condition on the algebra E such that the pullback is a G algebraoid and gives us a Leibniz parallelization? To do that, we need one more notion, and that's a notion of Co-Lagrangian. And this has appeared in lots of other places. Uh, initially in ONN, but people have also thought about it in the exceptional case. So suppose we have some uh, sub, -alg sub uh, vector space V in E. Remember, E is just a vector space because it's over a point. Let V0 live in E star be the annihilator of V. Then we can take V0 and use our map that takes uh, pairs of objects and maps them into N. They're now going to map into N star. And we say V is co-isotropic if that map is zero for every element for all elements, elements of V. And it's co-Lagrangian if it's maximally co-isotropic. And that's just an extension of the usual notion of iso uh, isotropy for, uh, for the metric case. You know, in any case. And there's one other ingredient, which is if we have some sub, um, algebra V, then um, since the image of D, so D remember was something that mapped into E from N, its image is an ideal. So you can quotient by it. And then under that projection onto the quotient, the projection of the subalgebra is a Lie algebra. So there's a way of going from the, from the subalgebra, sub Leibniz algebra to a Lie algebra. So here's the theorem which is the classification in 11 dimensions. So for the M, for the case where we look, look at 11 dimensional supergraph. So let E be an algebra, an algebra so just an algebra that's some embedding for some embedding tensor. And let, us, let there be a subalgebra V, which is co-Lagrangian, and it has to include the image of D, and its co-dimension is N. Then from that data, you can construct a generalized parallelization on the manifold, which is the coset of the corresponding groups. So E and V both have a corresponding Lie algebra. And from the simply connected Lie groups, we can take a manifold, which is the coset of those two groups. And that, so we then get an N exact, so one that's corresponding to 11 dimensional supergravity, Leibniz parallelization on M. And furthermore, all such, uh, Leibniz parallelizations arise this way. So the data you need is you have an embedding tensor algebra, and then you need this subalgebra, this co-Lagrangian subalgebra. If you have that, then you'll have a generalized parallelization. You can do this in type 2B as well. And basically it's exactly the same, except you need one more condition, which is a condition on some traces of adjoint actions of the subalgebra. And that condition is equivalent to saying that it restricts something about the trombone gauging of the gauge supergravity, if that's something you know about. So it's to do with whether you're gauging in the R plus direction. So it's very natural. In the ONN case, we simply would reproduce the structures that were uh, written by Kumchik and Severa and also by Severa and Balak and collaborators. So it just goes to the usual thing. That's, that's a familiar story. But, the, but we're seeing now the analog of that for the exceptional case. As I said, this problem's actually been already looked at by Inverso. So in a sense, we're just rewriting his results. There's actually a slight refinement 
um, essentially previously had a trace condition in the 11 dimensional case. And in fact, we find there isn't such a trace condition, but I think having spoken to Gianluca, I think we were, we we're all on the same page and they are the equivalent. So the nice thing is you get some very concrete uh, algebraic condition on those, um, those gauge supergravities um, that come from a dimensional, consistent dimensional relation. What about Poisson Liu duality in this picture? So let me remind you about the ONN case. So in the ONN case, our algebra, our Leibniz algebra, just became a Lie algebra with some um, metric on it. And uh, you have um, generalized parallelizations you can, uh, if you can find a, a maximal um, subalgebra H. Um, and then the point is, you might be able to find two such subalgebras, H and H star, um, so that you could pull back to get something on G mod H, or you could pull back to get something on G mod H sub, where those are the corresponding uh, B groups. If we can find such a thing, then the manifolds M and M star are Poisson Lee T dual, and H and H star are Poisson Lee dual groups. So, as I think many of you know, there's an example of this, which is the Jenfeld double, where actually the, the Lie algebra G is just H plus H star. But it could be more general than that. You just have to find subalgebras H and H star. Well, exactly the same thing can happen in this exceptional case. So now we need two different sub, sub uh, Leibniz algebras, V and V star, which are both co Lagrangian with this, with the, and have the trace condition of V. And then we can pull back in two different ways. And again, so we get uh, two different Poisson Lee U dual spaces and correspondingly two different uh, Poisson Lee U dual groups. So again, it's the same picture. You just have to be able to find these co Lagrangian and sub -algebras. And as I mentioned, people have already looked at Poisson Lee U duality. And this indeed is included in this, this structure that we're talking about. Actually, the structure is slightly more general because. Uh, there they were doing more things that look like analogs of the uh, Trimfeld duff. You can also try and think about generalized Young-Baxter, classical generalized Young-Baxter this way. So there's a very particular uh, um, generalized Schwartz reduction, which is the one that just comes from an ordinary Schwartz. So from that point of view, I just have a group manifold uh, and uh, with some Lie algebra G, and the um, uh, the uh, exceptional algebras I get are just constructed from G. So E is just G plus wedge two G star plus wedge five G star. Uh, v is wedge two G star plus wedge. Sorry, that's uh, oh sorry yeah. And then I can take a, a sub bundle which is just wedge two G star plus wedge five G star. That satisfies all the requirements that I have. That gives me some uh, sensible um, generalized parallelization, which is just the one that you get from ordinary Schoch-Schwartz. Now, what we can imagine doing is trying to move the V, uh, the coisotropic uh, V subalgebra. So I can act on it with some element of the exceptional group. All such coisotropic subspaces will be related by some element of the exceptional group. If it's one that actually moves this subalgebra, it actually just uh, the action it actually just lies in some um, sub subgroup of the exceptional group, which is generated by uh, three vectors, wedge three g, and uh, six vectors, wedge six g. And then you can do those deformations and require that the uh, new V prime still closes. And that will give you some conditions on this alpha and alpha tilde, which were the things that were doing the deformation. Those are the generalized young Baxter equations. And they indeed match what people have written down and already written down in relationship with generalized young Baxter. But we're understanding it from this, uh, from this using this um, subalgebra P. Okay, so that's pretty much what I was gonna tell you. 
and I think I'm roughly on time. So let me summarize a little bit and tell you some directions you might go in. So the idea was that G algebra is give us a useful sort of universal structure that includes generalized geometry. It gives us a way of thinking about consistent truncations as these pullbacks, and it gives us a nice um, algebraic geometrical picture of what Poisson the U duality is in this sort of direct analog of the T dual case. We found that it gave us a simple classification for consistent truncations. And of course, the natural question is, can you scan through for examples? To do that generally is probably quite complicated, but if you restrict to simple groups, you can certainly start looking at those questions. As I said, it gives us an extension of Q duality, uh, T duality uh, of uh, personally T duality to U duality. And it gave us uh, the classical yang baxter equations. So what other questions might you ask? So the structure strongly suggests that you would expect the appearance of these Leibniz algebras, E and V, in the sigma model description of what was going on. And again, I think that's already appeared in some of the talks in, in this meeting. Um, you can actually do this story with less supersymmetry. So there are also ways of describing consistent truncations where you don't go to a maximally supersymmetric theory, but a, or something with less. They also have algebroids sitting in them that look like these G algebroids, but in general, they're not transitive. So you can also ask a question with less supersymmetry if you have two different uh, truncations, which have the same low energy theory, you would be able to say that there was a duality there which may take you away from these particular, these, these cases. And then of course, another obvious question is, I haven't talked about um, the fact that these, this, this map, this U-duality map matches solutions to solutions. So we know it does because of consistent truncation. If they have the same, if they're both solutions of the truncated theory, by definition, they'll both be so, solutions of the two lifted theories. You can also just look at the equations for the lifted theories and look at this action and show directly that it maps solutions to solutions. But you might be interested to ask whether it also can include something that looks like a deformed supergravity in the same way that you can deform the, the deformed supergravities that appear in, the, in dualities of, uh, um, of ADS5, for example. And there it does look like there's a way of doing that, something we're thinking about, and it's to do with the way you formulate the supergravity using generalized geometry that's to do with um, uh, torsion. So you'd be interested to see if there's also a way of looking at de defining something that would be a deformed D equals 11 supergravity this map would still work for. Okay, there's lots of other directions you could go in, but maybe I should stop there. Thank you. Are there questions? Yes. Um, so I have a question about these, um, well, a couple of, well, the first one is about this generalized Yang-Baxter equation. So this is, this is some generalization of uh, normal classical Yang-Baxter. Do you know if it's ever appeared in any literature on integrability or algebras before? I mean, is it, is it a new equation or is it? So it's not totally new. So if I just think about the alpha one, it's like a three form deformation, a th three vector deformation. Mm -hmm. So rather than being like a two form Poisson deformation, it's more like some three form deformation and various people have talked about that. Um, I'm not sure I can give you good citations, but um, uh, sometimes associated with non-associativity, that's one way people try to think about it. But is there some integrability story behind? Yeah, uh, I um, I don't know. I don't know. Other people might know. Some other questions? Maybe uh, related to this uh, generalized team box there. So these are some examples of possible deformations. Is there a um, systematic way to classify um, allow deformations, or to put it in another way, a systematic way to understand each duality orbit that these backgrounds belong to, to understand how they are related, if there are only discrete uh, transformations, meaning duality transformations between them, or continuous transformations that 
the date, depending on the duality orbit, uh, which is considered. Um, yeah, that's good. I, uh, I don't know the answer to that. You can do, um, although I gave the example of deforming this conventional Schurk Schwartz, you could also deform any example. You could look to try and deform any example. Um, whether you'll be able to find continuous cases, I don't know beyond looking at it case by case. Um, but the certainly, um, uh, the, the possible continuous orbits, um, just that they're, they're sort of algebraically, they'll all look like deformations by some ex part of the exceptional group, which ones are actually allowed, of course, is a more complicated question, but that they will have that same structure, in fact, very similar to the one I've written here. Not very complete answer to you, I'm afraid. Thanks. Okay, some other questions? Maybe uh, I would have a question in connection with David Osten's talk. Uh, he spoke about this E model in this U duality context. Uh, so could you comment about that? You... Yeah, so uh, I need to understand that better, but I think many of the same structures are appearing here, right? So here's a charge vector, well, I'm not sure I'm using the right term, was something that was in this um, N bundle. So the same bundles were appearing. Um, uh, with a little more structure, which was sort of some analog of the symplectic structure. So yeah, I'd be interested to look at that better more and try and understand the connections. Okay, some other question? If not, so let's thank uh, Dan again. Thank you.